Welcome to Postcards, a brief look at people, places, the arts and curiosities from around the world. On today's program we visit a new gallery built to house some of the world's art treasures. Stunning wildlife photography from South Africa tours 17 countries. We explore the story of time and humanity's preoccupation with it. The Blitz International Dance Festival and a tiny shop keeps ballet dancers on their toes. But first up, one of the most dazzling arrays of some of the world's most sumptuous jewels went on display at Christie's prior to an auction of Indian royal and ceremonial ornaments. These are the jewels of the Crown of India from the 16th to the 18th century when the Mughal dynasty dominated the continent. It was a rule characterised by luxury, richness and a love of the arts. After the first emperor's conquests, successive generations inherited a wealthy, stable and influential kingdom. The high quality emeralds came from the mines of Colombia, which were controlled by Spain. The Portuguese had strong commercial links with Spain and bought these gems to the Mughals as presents in return for trade favours. The Mughal court fostered vast workshops which produced these beautiful pieces. The diamonds and other gems are embedded in gold. The reverse is even more splendid as the backs of each setting are worked with coloured enamelling. This pendant pearl and gem necklace suspends an enormous emerald weighing more than 161 carats and carved in relief with the flowering plant motive of Emperor Jahangir. It's estimated to fetch $1.28 million US. Inscribing a gem with the Emperor's name was a mark of appreciation for the beauty of the stone and bestowed on it respect and imperial dignity. For the Mughals, only the most exquisite gems could have the honour of bearing the Emperor's name. Many of the riches have come to Christie's from English families who inherited them from ancestors who lived in India. While many of the items for sale are museum pieces, exhibition houses will be bidding alongside anyone who finds these opulent treasures irresistible. A new art gallery in this history and tradition rich city. The original Guildhall Gallery was destroyed in the Blitz and its 4,000 works dispersed. Today, after 50 years, they've been rehoused in new $112 million US premises designed by Richard Gilbert Scott. There are royal portraits here and, as would be expected, mayoral studies from the 16th century onwards. Views of the capital feature prominently too, the Palace of Westminster in 1892, and the Thames from Whitehall Court, painted by Lord Methuen. There are also delightful and intimate views of London. Like this snapshot from a Spitalfields window, and spectacular moments of history captured on canvas. The fire at the old Drury Lane Theatre in 1809. The 250 works on permanent exhibition are a fascinating and hitherto hidden treasure of some remarkable works of art. A feature of the collection, one of the biggest paintings in the country. Still being restored, John Singleton Copley's defeat of the floating batteries at Gibraltar Painted in the 18th century, the epic work measures 27 feet by 19 feet.
Most visitors will, at some stage, head for the magnificent collection of pre-Raphaelite paintings. It includes this portrait by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The Ghirlandata was painted in 1873 after the artist suffered a mental breakdown and a laudanum overdose. Some beautiful studies of children are on show too. This rather eerie canvas is by Malaise. And this magnificent constable sketch for the painting of Salisbury Cathedral. The new gallery contains a computerised information system which enables the visitor to browse the collection at the touch of a fingertip. The gallery in the heart of the busy city has already opened its doors to the public and is proving a popular cultural attraction. It's become an annual celebration of the richness and biodiversity of the natural world the BG Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition. Here the baby white rhino jostles with the orangutan for attention. The cool beauty of great white egrets in the morning mist of a lake in Greece. It's a ravishing exhibition which is justly popular with professional and amateur alike. Both winners in the junior and adult categories came from South Africa. Jamie Tom, a ranger at the Malamada Game Reserve, took this stunning photo of a leopard resting at dusk to win the title. It has a mesmeric, unreal quality. Tom photographs a myriad of animals, but this photo, he says, stood out as being something a little bit different. A Malachite Kingfisher. The clarity of focus and intensity of colour won the best young wildlife photographer of the year for 16-year-old Nick Wilton. He got the shot early one morning in the Kruger Park, following the bird for more than 100 metres before it settled in the sun. But the competition isn't all about beauty. This picture of dead foxes by William Osborn was runner-up in the World in Our Hands category. All 143 stunning photographs from the competition were on display at the Natural History Museum before travelling to more than 30 destinations in Britain and 17 countries worldwide. Stroke, it will be 11, 59 and 50 seconds. It's 12 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. The news from London, read by James Pettigrew. Set back from the River Thames, a venerable, some might say unassuming institution, lies at the heart of Britain's millennium celebrations. The Royal Observatory at Greenwich was founded more than 300 years ago. Since then, its work has evolved from mapping the heavens to becoming the world's timekeeper. In the observatory's early years, successive astronomers royal plotted the movements of the stars to produce a nautical almanac for sailors. 
the Greenwich Time Ball, once a guide to boats on the Thames, still falls every day at 1pm. The observatory's role as a beacon of hope for shipping has been overtaken by technology, but it still marks time for the world. An exhibition at Greenwich, The Story of Time, explores the elusive phenomenon of time and humanity's preoccupation with it. It begins with the various creation myths, such as that of the Hindu god Shiva. A cosmic dancer, Shiva is the embodiment of both the eternal creative and destructive forces of the universe. For the North American Navajo Indians, the story of the world's origins is told through a sand painting, depicting a young hero receiving sacred plants. As with the Christian version of the creation in the Bible, it seems important for human beings to establish links with their ancestors. This calendar from the island of Bali is an early example of people's inclination to divide up time and to represent it pictorially. It shows days when it was considered lucky or unlucky to undertake particular activities. An incense stick in this Chinese fire clock burns through the threads at regular intervals, dropping ball bearings onto a tray. What for some people was cyclical, for others moved in a straight or not so straight line. In ancient China, the sun and moon were regarded as husband and wife, symbolising duality, the yang and yin of the universe. It was in relation to the sun that the earliest measurements of time were made through sundials. This 18th century German model. And this classical Chinese style indicated the time of day by casting a shadow as the sun moved across the sky. But the night sky too, as charted in this Chinese star map, provided clues to the rhythms of time through the movements of heavenly bodies. Each planet was associated with one of five elements. While this European map drew an imagined sphere of constellations around the North Pole, with those of the Southern Hemisphere around the edge. The enigmas of space were clearly caught up with those of time. Flimsy telescopes with poor quality optics gave way to sophisticated instruments like this transit circle, installed at Greenwich in the mid-19th century by the seventh Astronomer Royal, Sir George Airy. It was mounted on a north-south axis, which, as the Earth rotates, is the only reliable constant for the astronomer. Airy's prime meridian was adopted as a point of zero longitude from which everywhere else would be measured. As a result, visitors to the observatory can now straddle the line between the eastern and western hemispheres. The development of railways and the telegraph had made it vital to coordinate time variations between cities and countries that were at different stages of the day. Clockmakers invented increasingly complex mechanisms to achieve greater accuracy, and the clock became a feature of people's everyday lives and homes. Previously, they had been regarded as something in the public domain, but now the concept of domestic time was born. It transformed people's dependence on changes of the seasons as an indicator of the passage of time. These French marble statues of the four seasons celebrate the times of year which were so crucial to the sowing and harvesting of crops and needed to be estimated correctly. On an individual level, fear of old age destroying the beauty of youth has always been a human obsession. This painting by the Italian artist Pompeo Bertoni emphasises our subjective view of time and our powerlessness to stop it. Awareness of the transience of human existence led to the creation of mythical figures like Father Time, the Spanish artist Salvador Dali, the world's old certainties melted with atomic physics and the theory of relativity. The 28-inch refracting telescope at Greenwich was once the world's largest, unravelling the mysteries of space. Senior astronomer Dr Robin Catchpole says astronomy has an extraordinary asset. 
that because light travels at a finite speed, it means that unlike any other science, when we look a long way away, we also look back in time. Nothing to do with relativity or Einstein, just the finite speed of light. In recent years, especially with the development of the Hubble Space Telescope, we are able to look back to a time when the universe was a tenth of its present age. We can take pictures that far back. On the threshold of the 21st century, timepieces like this Casium fountain clock use laser beams to transform atomic particles between two different states. They are accurate within a fraction of a second over 50,000 years. From the ancient Greeks who strove to calculate longitude at sea to the Renaissance with its ornate terrestrial and celestial globes, human beings have constantly been absorbed and fascinated by the search to pin down time. The Persians used elaborate astrolabes like this one to make remarkably complex mathematical observations of the night sky. But as the search for refinement and precision continues, the question remains of how much it has benefited us and whether we're any wiser about the nature of time itself. Most of these participants have never ventured to India, but they're enjoying the rare chance to learn the rhythm of South Indian folk dance. The Blitz Dance Festival offers everyone the chance to learn dance and culture from all parts of the globe. What started as a one-day workshop has exploded into a three-week international dance festival. Staged at the Royal Festival Hall, the Blitz Festival is testament to the vast multicultural aspects of dance. The lessons and workshops cover a myriad of styles from Africa and South America to traditional Welsh dance. The event aims to make dance accessible and enjoyable to everyone. For the troops and instructors who give up their time to share their talents, the event is a chance to gain the attention of promoters and managers in the dance industry. The annual Blitz Festival is proving as popular as ever, organisers urging visitors to arrive early to ensure their place in Britain's biggest free dance event. Many of the leading ballet dancers in the world get their shoes from this tiny shop. Frederick Freed started his business in the early 1920s with his wife Dora, a milliner, and their shoes quickly became famous for quality and individual attention to detail. Freed's factory produces some 5,000 shoes a week, 80% of which are exported. They're all made of natural materials and the technique has changed little in a hundred years. The company has provided shoes for many star ballerinas, from Dame Margot Fontaine to Darcy Bussell. The toe of the point shoes is constructed from rye flour and hessian, and all are stamped with freed symbol. At the end of the working day, the shoes are put in an oven and baked for 12 hours. They're then cut to the individual measurements of the dancers.
World famous dancers often visit the factory. Desiree Ballantyne with the English National Ballet loves the movement and security the shoe gives. A dancer can get through something like 200 pairs of shoes a year, which keeps Freed's happily in business. Those who've been inside liken it to a spiritual, almost religious experience, promoting space and relaxation, a kaleidoscope of light and colour created from clear plastic sheeting. The temporary structure is nestling in the shadows of the Millennium Dome and measures over 1,000 square metres. A specially made fire-resistant plastic has been used. The sculpture, entitled Archipelago, is the creation of designer Alan Parkinson. It's the fifth luminarium Parkinson has designed, all a nomadic, monumental, inflatable labyrinths. Visitors to the archipelago are encouraged to take off their shoes and wander through the tunnels. However, for those unwilling to lose themselves in the phenomenon of light, maps are provided. Archipelago, as the name suggests, comprises a series of islands in the form of eight metre high domes incorporating Moorish tile patterns. The sculpture was handmade by a team of ten people over six months. And that's all for today. Join us again next time for a postcard look at interesting people, places and the arts. Mm -hmm.